It's, this is episode 23, libertarianprogressive.com. My name is Thomas Keegan, your host. Also, blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. Today we're interviewing David Ross, who's a libertarian, on the ballots. The only third-party option in his district, which is District 6 in Tennessee, for 2016, November 8th, for the U.S. House of Representatives. LibertarianProgressive.com is a real election channel, like we say, because we cover everyone on the ballot. We're an independent media organization. We interview independent third-party candidates. We believe if a candidate has gathered enough signatures and is on the ballot and has a statistical chance to win, then a responsible media will include them in the debate and interview them to educate and inform the electoral public of their options. And our goal is to interview 50-plus candidates. You can see them all at libertarianprogressive.com. Let's go ahead and give David a call and conduct this interview and let you know some of your options out there. If he's elected, he would affect U.S. law as a U.S. House of Representatives member. Hello, this is David Ross. Hi, David Ross. Good evening. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, uh, blogtalkradio.com slash election channel. Great to talk with you this evening. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing fine today. Doing fine. All right. And, of course, you're um, running for the, uh, again, District 6 in Tennessee, uh, and you're going to be on the ballot this November 8th, 2016. You're the only third-party option in your district. So um, let me ask you, why did you run as a libertarian and not um, just stay in the box, stay in the status quo? Why didn't you run as a Republican or a Democrat? Well, I've been a libertarian uh, most of my life. Uh, I actually came on being a libertarian way back listening to William F. Buckley on television. I don't know why I was fascinated by, by him. I guess maybe it was the way he talked, but the more I listened to him, the more it made sense, and um, I've pretty well been a solid libertarian uh, even before I knew what a libertarian was. Yeah, but, I like the way uh, that guy talks, uh, too. Yeah. That's, uh, that's kind of the way I, I started out being a libertarian, and I'm going to stay a libertarian probably for my whole life. I couldn't imagine running as anything else, personally. Yeah, I think one thing that he said was that you could probably pick and no, nothing against you, but, you know, just saying about our status quo, you could probably just pick random people out of the phone book and they might do a better job representing the regular people than, you know, the current people we have in politics. So why are you the better choice this year? And um, what would you do as a representative if you were given a chance for two years to, you know, go to Washington to represent your district, sir? Well, everyone goes to Washington, one voice, one vote. And uh, every bill that comes up, they can vote for it or against it or abstain from voting. So it's not that it's a complex job as far as the function of being a congressperson. Uh, It's usually a matter of figuring out the waters. But uh, I think putting a libertarian in, in the House of Representatives would probably shake the halls of power to a certain degree. Um, Right now, the Republicans and Democrats, based on their performance of the past 20 years, have done a terrible job. And I don't think you can blame either party for the mess that we're in. Uh, Wars all over the world, uh, nations on fire, thousands of people being slaughtered, $20 trillion in debt, and they never told us where all that $20 trillion went. Uh, All I know is that they spent it, and it doesn't seem like we have much to show for it. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. Let's go through your issues here. I mean, you have some, and and again, we're talking with David Ross for the U.S. House of Representatives, Libertarian candidate in the 6th District of Tennessee. And and you can visit uh, David hyphen Ross, R-O-S-S dot Ruck, R-U-C-K dot U-S. And... um, and you have here uh, issues listed on your the, on the front home page, but um, you have everything from the tax code, freedom of speech, constitutional rights, 
and um, public safety, uh, foreign policy, immigration, and drug policy. Let's actually just um, start off with drug policy. The war on drugs started by, I believe, Richard Nixon back in way back in the 1970s. We're still, you know, people say Afghanistan is the longest war we've ever been in. What about the war on drugs? Well, the war on drugs actually started way, way back in the in San Francisco in the 1800s. Ironic of all places, but uh, it, there was actually been a war to stop people from doing drugs that goes back that far, and, and in some ways even precedes that. A lot of it goes back to the Victorian era mindset that everything's a sin if it makes you happy. That, and uh, that I know that seems kind of strange to us today. But there were a lot of people in the 1800s who believed that a person should live a stoic life. And a lot of that still leads today. Um, I think it's been – the war on drugs has been a total failure, no matter how you measure it. Uh, we spent trillions of dollars, and we're no closer to ending drugs now than we were when we started. And I think the states ought to decide how they want to handle drugs. We – allowed Colorado, the Colorado experiment and the Washington experiment, and, you know, the states have not destroyed themselves. Uh, some states might want to go down that route, and some states may not be ready. Uh, when, I, when I went to college in Alabama, there were dry counties all over the place that are, are left over from prohibition, where they don't allow people to sell or purchase in their county. And I think that would probably be a better idea that let each state handle it their way because every state's different. Yeah, and maybe even down to the county level, let each county handle. But you know, that's for the future. I, I would say one other thing: if if you're in a state that doesn't allow it, and 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 if you're arrested for that and prosecuted, you should at least have the option to either go to jail if you want to stay in that state, or move to a state where you wouldn't go to jail for it, maybe. And, um, well, I, you know, there's so many different ways to handle it, but at the end of the day, the people closest to the problem, I think, handle it best. There's too many people in Washington that are, that have a financial interest in keeping drugs illegal. Um, you know, But I think the people of Tennessee could probably decide what's best for us. If you go somewhere like Alaska where everyone's – uh, you know, lives an isolated life. They may want to handle the problem different from, let's say, Florida or California might want to do things different from Maine and everywhere in between. Uh, the states all have very intelligent people who have duplicate uh, law enforcement agencies to what the U.S. government has. I think they can decide what to do with it judicially, legally, and, and uh how to enforce whatever laws they wish to have. So like 50 laboratories of freedom and, um, and then just get the federal government out of it, get rid of the DEA uh, and don't have the FDA scheduled as like a class one drug and stuff like that. Well, you could, you could have all of the tasks that the DEA does uh, under the auspices of the FBI or, or, you know, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and we just have so many different agencies. This, this should be a sub-agency of another uh, law enforcement entity, if we even keep it at all. But every single state has their own drug task force. Uh, you know, in, in Tennessee, in my state, there's a huge problem with uh, prescription drug abuse and painkillers, and uh, then there's meth and and uh, all these other, you know, other uh drugs that that are ravaging our state but it's hard to have a one-size-fits-all uh solution to that problem that's going to work the same in every state i just i think we're wasting our time and uh history has proven me right so far yeah and definitely you wouldn't impose on colorado's or washington or alaska's um choice to make it legal you wouldn't march in there and stop them from doing what they're doing and uh so that is that sounds good. And um, now what about um, immigration? Uh, you put here the consequences of an unrestricted border has cost American lives and could lead to even more unintended consequences. And then on this subject, you're deeply conflicted on a moral level as, far as, a, as well as a practical level. If you could explain your, um, your approach to the immigration uh, issue. 
Well, it's very easy for people who are in New England to point their finger down and say, open the border, because the vast majority of the problem is streaming across through Texas, New Mexico, California, and Arizona. Uh, those, you know, and so to make rules for our border that affect those states more than anyone else, uh, I think is is probably a little. Uh, I think it's a little unfair to those states who have a border. And New York, to be to be honest, New York and and Boston, you know, have a lot of people come in on air travel. But a vast majority of people that immigrate to this country you know, come across our southern border. And I, I think uh, um, we can't be imposing rules that make us feel good. But yet, I do have compassion for the people that want to better themselves. But we just have to have a better way of doing it than telling the the border guards not to do their job. And uh, you know, if you're if you're going to change the laws, go ahead and change them. Uh, quit denying laws. If we cease to be a country of laws, then you know, if the if the president uh, has an option of not enforcing a law, then why have laws? Uh, why don't the president just tell us what laws he will enforce and won't enforce when he puts his hand on the Bible and swears that he's going to, you know, enforce the laws of the land. So uh, as far as the moral conflict, I just really, I, I feel for people, but then, you know, when you look at the immigrants from the Middle East, 90% of them are male. Why aren't they bringing their wives with them? Why aren't they, why aren't they bringing their families with them? Why are so many people immigrating to this country? from the Middle East, uh, single males. Uh, that bothers me. But yet I want yeah, to that, see people have an opportunity. Yeah, and so we'll segue into the next issue about foreign policy. And um, so what about, uh, you, you know, that's one of your issues here. We can no longer afford to keep purchasing friends and financing repressive leaders. Um, do you think our foreign policy has anything to do with was anything to do with the uh, immigration from the Middle East? Well, remember that uh, when we're talking, when you're talking about ISIS, um, and I was talking to uh, someone I know who's from the Middle East. He was an interpreter uh, in Iraq, and he said, "You know, they're all Wahhabist, and Wahhabist, of course, is a, a religious sect from Saudi Arabia." And uh, you know, that's that. I didn't think about that, and, and it really struck me that. Here we are, we're friends with Saudi Arabia, and we're allies with Turkey, and both of them are doing things, backdoor channel ways of helping ISIS out. And so what I'm having a hard time understanding is, you know, do we even have an end game? Do we, are we just playing uh, political maneuvering with other people's lives? Uh, I, I understand that you know, so many soldiers uh, have fought in the Middle East to try to straighten this mess out, and nobody wants to walk away from the job undone. But I think it's about time that we let uh, the people of that region deal with it. Uh, I would be willing to put a little bit of the of the load on letting uh, Russia have a certain amount of uh, sway in the Middle East because that's their backyard. You know, you cannot do things uh, in the Middle East that Russia doesn't like when it's in their backyard. Uh, we're not going to be able to win anything. Uh, we have people all over the world that hate us. And, and the whole concept of the war on terror has always struck me strange that we are fighting a war against people who don't like us. Yet everything we do makes people in that area not like us even more. Yeah, and um, so let me ask you this in a different kind of way. Um, so, again, we're talking with uh, David Ross, um, who's uh, a libertarian candidate for the 6th District in Tennessee, and he's the only third-party option on the ballots. And um, so he's going to be an option this November 8th, 2016, besides uh, the, Republic, the Republican. And you do have a Republican and Democrat um, opponent, is that right, or just one or the other? I have two. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, Diane Black, who, who's uh, one of the most powerful women in uh, in Congress, and uh, the Democrats' uh, candidate's name is David Kent. 
Yeah, because I've seen some some districts where there isn't even an opponent. There's just one person on the ballot, and it's kind of crazy. Um, but uh, but most places do have some competition, and we'd like to see more competition in here, of course. Um, so let me ask you about just to follow up on this foreign policy. So if David Ross could, you know, wave a magic wand, let's say, or just give a vision, um, and let's say we you know, work things out over the next 10 years and, you know, how would you envision, have us picture, what would be the U.S.'s role in the world? How would the world be operating as far as our foreign policy goes um, if everything was, you know, I guess somewhat ideal? I mean, nothing's going to be perfect, but, you know, how, how would you envision our role? And, and if you could look into a crystal ball in 10 years, if, you know, libertarians or people that think like you do could have their way. Well, I would, I would certainly draw the U S back from, from um, all of our foreign uh, entanglements. Uh, our founding fathers warned us about getting tangled in, uh, in all of these other countries affairs we have 800 bases in 160 countries, costing us 500 some odd billion dollars a year. Um, I don't know why we still have military bases in Japan, in Korea, in Germany. Those countries are very capable of taking care of themselves. Uh, matter of fact, we have multiple uh, military bases in Germany itself. But with so many different countries that we are in, we're certainly having to support our military there. We're certainly having to, to pay to build them. We're certainly having to pay to maintain them. So at a certain point, uh, we're going to go broke trying just to maintain our network of bases around the world. We're not going to be able to afford a conflict if it does break out until we can get our economic house in order. So we may be militarily strong, but if you're financially weak, uh, that can pretty well undermine all of your war efforts. So for me, I would see a more humble foreign policy. If, if a country needs our help, they'll open their military bases for us. Um, I would like to see us have a more defensive military. And, uh, you know, one of the ideas that I would like to see is uh, a foreign legion, uh, kind of like patterned after the French foreign legion. Uh, back in the old days, when a person, a young person, got in trouble with the law, they got an option from the judge to join the military or go to prison. And I kind of think that wouldn't be a bad idea for today to give young people an option who get in trouble to join the foreign legion and serve half of their sentence in uh, the, in the military, rather than spend all that time sitting in prison with over a prison that, in and of itself, is a drain on our society. So yeah, I would say I know, might humble. teach them some discipline too. Right, but uh, there's so many different things we could be trying. But Congress is so wrapped up with either or that it, it seems like nothing is getting done. So, um, but now the president is the one who makes the final decision on foreign policy. Uh, Congress can push in a certain direction and control in a certain direction, but there's going to have to be a lot of walls break, broke down before we can make any relevant changes in our society. All right. Well, that, that sounds, uh, yeah, pretty ideal. Like, uh, kind of somewhat like how the founding fathers envisioned it. Um, and, uh, and also very interesting about, um, you, you know, somewhat of the foreign legion model and, uh, and that kind of transitions into, um, you know, you do have a lot, on here about uh, constitutional rights. Um, I'm thinking about an Edward Snowden quote actually recently. I'm just going to paraphrase because I don't have it right here in front of me, but he said something about people who say they have nothing to hide in regards to privacy. It's like saying the same thing as, um, you know, I have nothing to say in regards to the uh, freedom of speech. But now I'm not saying that's your position, but, but you do have a couple of, um, issues here regarding constitutional rights, freedom of speech, privacy, liberty and freedom, faith in government, states' rights. So constitutional rights, uh, civil liberties, um, it's one of your major 
points of your platform. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that's the hallmark. I mean, what is the use of doing everything without those? But can you explain to us why you have such a passion about that, why that's um, one of your main issues, and what would be your approach regarding constitutional rights? Well, it's it's real easy to say what we're going to do is we're going to go out and we're going to outlaw jerks. No more jerks allowed in America. Well, who decides who the jerk is? Uh, at a certain point, it gets to be a matter of opinion determining what people can do. True liberty is giving other people the right to do things that you don't agree with so that they will defend your right to do things that they don't agree with. Um, I don't think, you know, even when you go back to the to the early days of our country, I don't know that we've ever had perfect freedom, but I think if the federal government would stop trying to enforce all of our freedoms and liberties and decide what's right and what's wrong out of Washington, at least the people will have more of a chance to change things if they're not happy with it. It's very hard to change things in the federal capital, but it's not so hard to change things in a state capital when enough people get angry. Freedom is what we're supposed to be all about. I mean, what are, what are our soldiers fighting for? You know, they all say freedom and liberty. And so you look at, at, at the sacrifices that have been made to give us freedom and liberty, but we don't really seem serious about it. It's you have the right to do what I think we all ought to do, rather than saying you can do what you want to do, I'll do what I want to do, and we'll leave each other alone unless you hurt somebody. And to me, there's never going to be a perfect, a perfect way but where does my right to my life and my body start and the government's right to tell me what to do in? And that's the question. And that's where the line has to be drawn at some point. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like the golden rule in a sense and um, not being hypocrites, um, you know, do unto others as you want have to have done unto you and, uh, and uh, intolerance and, um, so it does make sense to me. Uh, now, um, let's see here. What about uh, the tax code? And I'll just also throw in the budget with that. Um, you know, how much is uh, you're alluding to before about um, our national defense, and you kind of tied it into being fis- fiscally sound as well. And um, but overall, what what do you think about the tax code and um, and our budget, 19 trillion, approaching 20 trillion now. Right. Uh, for me, the answer is to get the money out of Washington without them getting their hands on it. Uh, for instance, if you look at you know all of the uh, the programs that we have to help the poor, it takes 70 cents out of every dollar to get. 30 cents out of every dollar into the hands of someone who needs it. 70% of it is sucked up with bureaucracy in Washington. Too many sticky fingers up there saying, okay, well, I'm going to put this money to this project and this money to that project. So I go back to what I was saying about the states. Every state has their own Department of Education, Department of Transportation, and all these other departments. Why not take the money in Washington and just give it to the states, no strings attached, and say, okay, what can you do with this money for education? If you could double the amount of money given to each state for education, you could still save money over the overall budget and double the amount of money that the teachers and the school systems actually get their hands on. And I think the same thing can be said for any of these bureaucracies. They suck up too much of the money that could be out there doing good. And I'm really, uh, as far as it goes, if the the federal government wants to collect taxes, you know, that's the fight for another day as to how we tax ourselves. But right now I think the important thing is to get the money out of Washington and the corruption will dry up. If there's nothing to influence uh, your power over, uh, if all the money just goes straight to the states without being touched, then we don't really have much of a corruption problem because the corruption is on how the money's divvied up. We can't have a robust economy with so many people 
tweaking it from so many different departments in so many different areas. So I think we starve ourselves of of uh, the resources we need to grow through regulation and through rules and regulations and laws. I think the states can handle that just fine. Uh, once again, I go back to each individual state is different, and uh, what's going to work in one state won't work in another, and a one-size-fits-all policy that governs the economy uh, is not going to benefit every single state as it should. Uh, as far as taxes, you know, if they're going to collect taxes, um, I would rather it be a different way, but I don't see the IRS being abolished anytime soon, even though the politicians in Washington have been promising that for the last 20 years. They haven't made a move to stop it. Uh, for the last 20 years, the Republicans have said, well, let's do away with this department and that department, and they haven't done it. So um, they're not going to keep their word. So I think the first step is to get the money out of Washington with as little influence as possible. Yeah, and I hear the word that sticks out in my mind is competition. I mean, it's kind of hard to have a lot of innovation if a monopoly controls everything. And so if you did have, like, you know, per se, 50 laboratories of freedom, maybe if you also had more political parties, you know, there's some areas in life where there just simply isn't enough competition and there's a one size fits all. And that seems to be holding back. I mean, competition can do a lot of good. It lets people free to try new things and learn from each other and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, well, let me um, ask you just a few questions here, uh, David, in our uh, remaining time, um, and we appreciate you taking the time. And again, um, we've been talking with David Ross, who's a Libertarian candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives, District Number Six in Tennessee, and um, he's going to be on the ballot this November eighth. And uh, he's the third option besides Republican and the Democrats. And um, well, I did want to ask you. Um, let's see here. Uh, have you been in the debates? Have there been any debates in your area as yet? Are there any coming up? Uh, no, there's no debates that I know of going to happen. I think uh, I think Diane Black, the uh, person who's currently uh, the uh, the favorite to win, uh, would probably feel like it's not necessary. I would be more than happy to debate, but uh, you know she is the odds-on favorite to. Uh, to win the election this fall, but I'm still going to keep trying and keep fighting. Uh, I did four events this weekend that I went to and passed out cards and talked to people. So I'm still going to push uh, as hard as I can, but there's not any debates and I doubt that there will be. Um, the, I would be more than willing to challenge her, but right now I'm just having a hard time getting press time. So you would be more than willing to have a debate. You'd be more than willing to have one debate right you'd be willing to have three oh, four yeah. yes because the, the whole point of my campaign is the republicans and the democrats have utterly failed the people completely any way that you want to measure it whether you're looking at economic whether you're looking at foreign policy whether you're looking at at, at people's satisfaction they have failed the people in every way imaginable with all of their squabbling and infighting and and uh you know deal cutting so yeah, I think it would be easy to attack not the person because from all accounts she's a very nice person, but I can attack their parties as being the ones that's failed. And uh, for your generation, I'm assuming that you're younger than me, I'm looking forward to your generation taking over. I think uh, I think the uh, baby boomers have pretty well messed things up quite a bit, and I don't see them fixing it because they created the mess. And until your generation takes over, uh, neither party is going to change, and there will be no other parties in the mix. Let me ask you this, because hindsight's twenty twenty, we know, but um, let's say you did get elected, and then in two years you were the incumbent. Now, I, I know some people don't like the word pledge or whatever, but if you were the incumbent, would you, could you promise us that you would be open to debating whoever would challenge you in two years if you were the incumbent? No problem. I mean, uh, because debating, I don't look at debating as a challenge. I look at it as an opportunity to learn, to learn where 
Uh, other people say I've failed, or other people will say uh, this is how I would have done it different. And so I'm open to hearing what other people have to say, even if it's in a debate forum. But, uh, you know, yes, uh, as a matter of fact, I've even signed the uh, term limit pledge. I, you know, I've, I don't want to be there forever. I signed up to run for office because I frankly got a little bit angry at either or politics. Yeah, and I don't mean to keep um, pressing on this issue, but I think that's very int- – I mean, there are – I have seen a handful of districts where the representative has chosen to abstain from the debates, but it's very, very rare. And, um, you know, it just reminds me of like a monopoly kind of attitude or something like that. I mean, it's, it seems kind of – no matter how nice she is, I mean, it just seems kind of opposite of – you know, the democratic way, um, I have to say, I, I mean, it just, I, yeah, I, I don't mind saying that. It just does not seem like too democratic. Um, and uh, even she, if, but, if you but support for her, her yeah. but for her, she has nothing to gain from debating. So if she can win without debating, that's fine. She could go out into a debate and, and, and may have a misstep or say the wrong word, as I could too. And so she really has nothing to gain. So I really can't fault her uh, as a as she being a political person from not wanting to debate. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I have everything to gain. So I can understand it. I don't agree with it, but I do understand where she's coming from. And and the the citizens might have a lot to gain and uh, and, and not much to lose. Um, you know, the constituents. Um, and who knows, in the big picture, maybe she does have something to gain because she's kind of setting a precedent that maybe she wouldn't want her kids to grow up in, you know, that's a little less democratic. But, you know, uh, so let me ask you this, David. Um, what about, um, uh, may I ask you, do you have any or who's some of your favorite past or present people elected or not, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us? Well, you know, uh that's that's difficult uh you know it depends now if you're talking about politics uh, i was a fan of of uh, ron paul uh as far as uh commentators and and philosophers i've always been a fan of william f buckley jr i mean i always thought he was a cool guy i know it probably says a lot about you know the kind of teenager i was but i always thought he was really a cool guy and so uh i so I'd say Ron Paul and William F. Buckley Jr. are two of my favorites. I did like Ronald Reagan's style. There's not everything that he did I agree with, but uh, you know there there was a lot to like about him as far as uh, willing things to happen and making things happen. But uh, um, you know all heroes have feet of clay. All heroes are are mortal, and so uh, everyone has their faults. Uh, you know, you could go down some of the greatest men in history, and they had their faults. But uh, I prefer to focus on on the, the pluses on all of those people. So, sure, sure. I like William F. Buckley. I, I think um, you know he's probably known more as a conservative, but you know you don't really see conservatives in the public arena debating like he did, and he wasn't afraid to debate. Um, and uh, so. I, he had a lot, of, and he wouldn't mind debating for hours against people he totally, um, you know, disagreed with, and and to get to the bottom of things, um, you know, very respectful in that way. You know, he was also one of the early people against the war on drugs, which I respect, and you know, might have been harder to say back then. Um, did he like Milton Friedman at all, or? Yes, but. Uh, I'm not as well read in, in Milton Friedman uh, as a lot of other libertarians are. You know, for me, uh, you know, I would read people like P.J. O'Rourke because I, I I think through humor you clarify uh, a lot of issues. Humor has always been a cutting way to to uh, to dissect uh, ways of thought. And so I've always uh, respected him and, and George Carlin to a certain degree. He I was, was just going to say he was George certainly, Carlin. Yeah. yeah. So when you look at, at great comedians who can slice and dice up stuff to where you can grasp it and understand it and, and be entertained at the same time, I mean, that's a gift. I like Bill Maher. I don't agree with him often, 
but I like to watch his show because he makes me think. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that he says that I'm not too keen on. Um, you know, to me, he's just too much of a, a, a lefty um, and a, too much of a socialist. But uh, I do respect him, and I do enjoy watching him on TV. Uh, it's very cool to hear. I, I totally hear what you're saying. I mean, half of what he says is going to make me totally upset. But you know what? I still like to listen to him once in a while because, you know, the other half is interesting and, and he does make me think. And someone like that, of course, is probably going to cut both ways like that because, you know, he says he just says it. So, well, David, it's been a pleasure. Um uh, we do thank you for your time to talk to our audience today. Uh, this full episode is also going to be later on for people to listen to at libertarianprogressive.com in about 24 more hours. And so any other final words of, of wisdom in the final moments that we have here? Well, uh, you know, my dad was a, a preacher, and one thing he always told me about small-town churches is that nothing's going to change until you have three funerals. And I think a lot of that is the same with Washington. There's going to have to be a, because they're not giving up their power easy. So nothing's really going to change until you have about three or four funerals of some very important people in high places. And I think things will slowly start to change in this country and your generation will have to take over this mess. All right. Well, and, uh, you are. We appreciate being able to interview you, and, and the reason why we are able to today is because you got on the ballot, and you're providing a choice. And so, so um, you know, there's likelihoods, but there is a chance. And uh, so we'll see how it goes. And uh, good luck in your campaign, David. Um, again, people can uh, visit, uh, you know, you can just probably Google David Ross Congress, Tennessee, but uh, the website again is david-ross.ruck, R-U-C-K dot U-S. And uh, so if you're interested in the future in politics and American politics, uh, you know, take a look at his uh, campaign. Well, it's a pleasure. Again, thank you for your time, and um, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you very much, and you have a good one, too.